Hi friends. So now we will be discussing a very important topic, hypertension in pregnancy. You see this everywhere. You'll see this in your clinics. You'll find this in your theory papers. You'll find this in your MCQs. It's a very, very important topic. Hypertension in pregnancy. We've covered this in five parts and let's begin. Part one, which we'll deal with the basics. That is definitions of different hypertensions in pregnancy. What is the etiology and how can we predict the eclampsia? So let's start with a case scenario. A 21 year old primary gravida presents at 30 weeks for a routine antenatal checkup. Her blood pressure is 140 by 100 and a repeat reading after 30 minutes is the same. A urine protein reveals 2 plus proteinuria. What is the diagnosis? Okay, so we learn how to diagnose different types of hypertension in pregnancy. Chronic hypertension basically means a, a woman who is already hypertensive and then she becomes pregnant. So one could be that she's already hypertensive. The second scenario is could be possible is she becomes hypertensive before 20 weeks of pregnancy. Okay, so usually when we talk about preeclampsia, eclampsia, these are hypertensive disorders which happen after 20 weeks of pregnancy. Any hypertension which is starting before 20 weeks of pregnancy and it doesn't settle down once the pregnancy is over then also it is called as chronic hypertension and the third scenario is that pregnancy the hypertension onset is after 20 weeks but you find that even after 12 weeks postpartum that means three months after delivery also she is still hypertensive so that is what is known as chronic hypertension okay so let's repeat she's already hypertensive or the blood pressure becomes high before 20 weeks of gestation and persists to be high even after the pregnancy is over or the hypertension starts after 20 weeks but persists even after 12 weeks postpartum what is gestational hypertension gestational hypertension is hypertension which usually occurs after 20 weeks of pregnancy but there is no proteinuria okay there is no proteins in the urine no proteinuria is gestational hypertension what is preeclampsia preeclampsia is blood pressure which rises after 20 weeks so hypertension after 20 weeks in the presence of proteinuria which is usually taken as one plus in a random sample or more than 300 milligram in a 24 hour urine collected sample of urine that is preeclampsia eclampsia is the occurrence of seizures in a woman who is already preeclamptic that is eclampsia okay and what is preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension this is new onset proteinuria occurring after 20 weeks so proteinuria occurring after 20 weeks in a woman who is already chronic who's having chronic hypertension this is preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension to get a better idea let's show you this timeline now in this timeline it says this preconception this 20 weeks this term and this 12 weeks postpartum so what is chronic hypertension that means she so chronic we talk about chronic hypertension she may have already been hypertensive and then she becomes pregnant or hypertension occurring before 20 weeks and lasting beyond 42 weeks or hypertension starting after 20 weeks but persisting even after 12 weeks postpartum this is chronic hypertension what is gestational hypertension is hypertension after 20 weeks with no proteinuria okay and this usually settles down before 12 weeks postpartum. What is preeclampsia? Preeclampsia is hypertension after 20 weeks with proteinuria. What is eclampsia? Eclampsia is preeclampsia plus seizures. And what is preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension? The woman is already chronically hypertensive and after 20 weeks there is also presence of proteinuria so these are the different types or the different spectrum of hypertensive disorders that we see in pregnancy all right now coming to the next part 
is the etiology or first of all measuring blood pressure in pregnancy so how do we measure blood pressure in pregnancy it should be measured at every visit if the bp is more than 140 by 90 on two occasions at least four hours apart is when we say she is hypertensive it is measured in the sitting or the left lateral position and the patient's arm should be at the level of her heart. Now there's a new thing which is up, which is re recently given in the books and which we have been seeing this happen called as Delta Hypertension. What is Delta Hypertension? Delta Hypertension is a sudden rise in the mean arterial pressure later in pregnancy also signifies severe signifies preeclampsia even if the blood pressure is less than 140 by 90. So what we see is that women who have features of preeclampsia but the blood pressure is less than 140 by 90, their blood pressure may be say 130 by 80 or even 120 by 80. This is called delta hypertension. Their baseline blood pressure was low. So if you go back to their records and check, you'll find her blood pressure was always 100 by 60 and now it's 120 by 80 and other features of preeclampsia are also there so the blood pressure is less than 140 by 90 but that's because her baseline blood pressure was always low and now there is a rise but the rise is less than 140 by 90 but features of preeclampsia are still there proteinuria is there and that is called as delta hypertension so remember this when the bp is less than 140 by 90 it could still be preeclampsia and that's called as delta hypertension now, why does preeclampsia happen? And our, our concentration will be amongst all the types of hypertension, we'll be concentrating on preeclampsia and eclampsia. All right, so why does preeclampsia happen? So, this is the non pregnant. The first diagram is the non pregnant uterus. Okay, so this is the myometrium. Okay, this is the endometrium. So, and these are the spiral arterioles. Can you see these, these uh, spirally things? These are the spiral arteries, okay, which connect to the radial artery at the end. Okay, now what happens in a normal pregnancy? Okay, can you see this endometrium is now called the decidua and these cells are trophoblastic cells which are invading the vessels. They are inv invading the spiral arterioles and see how nicely they have opened up. They have become dilated, they have opened up and this allows for blood increase blood flow to the fetus right so this invasion trophoblastic invasion occurs in two waves okay in the first trimester and in the second trimester and it occurs all the way up till the myometrium but what happens in preeclampsia so this is normally what happens and this is what happens in preeclampsia you can see the difference there is trophoblastic invasion of the spiral arterioles but you can see it is lacking it is insufficient it is inadequate so what happens that the, as a result of this inadequate trophoblastic invasion the spiral arterioles open up but not so much so there is restricted blood flow which is entering the placenta which is end supplying the fetus so as a result there is now a inadequate blood flow blood supply to the fetus and this is what the basic pathology is in preeclampsia in other words inadequate trophoblastic invasion especially in the second wave which happens in the second trimester around 20 weeks this fails to happen adequate invasion fails to happen so the spiral arterioles remain constricted okay now why does this happen there have been various postulates okay why this has ha why this happened proposed pathways have been decreased nitric oxide decreased heme oxygenase oxidative stress genetic environmental factors okay so this is what happens in stage one okay so as a result there is placental ischemia or retroplacental insufficiency and there's inappropriate spiral artery remodeling which we just discussed okay so there are several factors which have been uh, postulated okay so there's decreased um, placental growth factor VEGF and there's increased factors like SFLT1, SNG and these have actually been used as predictive markers for preeclampsia and we'll discuss this a bit more later on okay so there are also unknown maternal factors so all in all this is what is happening and as a result there is hypertension there is proteinuria there's acute kidney injury there is 
capillary leak and pulmonary edema in the if it affects the cns there's headache seizures okay there is increased lfts hepatic infarction there's activated coagulation system leading to dic and thrombocytopenia so this is what exactly is happening inside the body in preeclampsia now very important to understand is can we predict in any way a woman who may have or may develop preeclampsia so yes there are several ways they're not completely accurate but yes we can predict women who may have preeclampsia and we can also prevent preeclampsia at least severe preeclampsia from happening so what are the predictors of preeclampsia there are clinical risk factors there are bio chemical markers and their biophysical or ultrasound doppler markers which can tell us that yes this woman is definitely at high risk of developing preeclampsia so what are the clinical risk factors we can divide them as high risk factors and moderate risk factors high risk factors number one is autoimmune disease like apla acquired phospholipid antibody syndrome chronic hypertension diabetes mellitus if she's had preeclampsia in her previous pregnancies and chronic kidney disease these are five high risk factors what are the moderate risk factors if she's a primary gravida okay so primaries are at higher risk or if the interpregnancy interval has been more than 10 years if she's more than 40 years of age if her bmi she is more than 35 take okay, that is that is she's morbidly obese if she has a family history of preeclampsia or if she has multiple pregnancies so these are moderate risk factors okay now if she has any one high risk factor or two or more moderate risk factors for such women we need to start them on profile axis and how what do we give we give ecosprin or low dose aspirin and that i will come to okay what are the biochemical risk factors so there are several biochemical factors one is placental growth factor placental protein 13 vascular endothelial growth factor and pregnancy associated plasma protein a these are all found to be decreased in women who have who will develop preeclampsia later on okay also two other markers so these are all decreased okay the growth factors placental growth factor vascular endothelial growth factor placental protein 13 and pap a these are all decreased what is increased the one starting with s so soluble fms like tyrosine kinase and soluble endoglin these are found to be increased in women who will later on develop preeclampsia and the third group of risk factors are biophysical risk factors these are ultrasound parameters okay so what do we do in ultrasound we see the uterine artery at 11 to 14 weeks and we in the this is the uterine artery dropper in this we see the pulsatility index p i okay p i is pulsatility index a raised pulsatility index means a higher resistance so a raised p i is indicative is a predictor for preeclampsia that means the uterine artery has a lot of resistance to blood flow another thing we look for in the uterine artery in the mid trimester can you see this notch this is a normal uterine artery okay see this one can you see this notch here 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 so normally this notch should disappear by the second trimester persistent notching so notching of the uterine artery up if you first still find this at 22 24 weeks this means that this is a bad uterine artery there is resistance in this uterine artery and this woman can develop preeclampsia later on this is a late change so it's not really predictor but if there is high umbilical artery resistance like how we see in fetal growth restriction this is another indicator or a predictor of preeclampsia but this is seen late after everything has already happened and at this point of time you can't do much you can't give profile access okay so how do we predict preeclampsia uh, between 11 to 13 or 11 to 14 weeks of pregnancy this is 14 weeks of pregnancy what do we do we can based on clinical risk factors based on ultrasound markers mainly the uterine artery pi and based on biochemical markers we calculate the risk of preeclampsia okay she could be low risk in which we continue routine antenatal care or she could be high risk in which we give intensive antenatal care and we start low dose aspirin prophylaxis 
before 16 weeks of pregnancy we give 150 milligram sorry 150 milligram of low dose aspirin starting before 16 weeks of pregnancy if any of these risk factors predict that she is of high risk so how do we prevent preeclampsia at high risk we give 75 to 150 milligram of aspirin from 12 weeks onwards ideally before 16 weeks this needs to be started to prevent preeclampsia so let's recap what are the definitions what are the different types of preeclampsia or sort of the different types of hypertension pregnancy we have chronic hypertension what is chronic hypertension the woman is already hypertensive and she becomes pregnant or hypertension persisting beyond 12 weeks of pregnancy or hypertension starting before 20 weeks of pregnancy what is gestational hypertension is hypertension after 20 weeks but without any proteinuria what is preeclampsia preeclampsia is when there is hypertension after 20 weeks with proteinuria how much proteinuria 1 plus or more than 300 mg in a 24 hour sample what is eclampsia eclampsia is seizures in the presence of preeclampsia and what is preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension is a woman who is already hypertensive after 20 weeks if she develops proteinuria this is preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension what is the etiology behind it there because of several factors several postulated theories there is incomplete trophoblastic invasion of the spiral arterioles and especially in the second wave this fails to happen how do we predict preeclampsia we have clinical risk factors we have biochemical risk factors and we have ultrasound doppler features mainly in the ultrasound doppler we have the uterine artery pulsatility index if this is high that means there is a resistance to flow in the biochemical markers we have the growth factors placental growth factor pap a vascular endothelial growth factor which are decreased in preeclampsia the clinical risk factors we have things like apla diabetes history of preeclampsia okay these are all high risk factors for preeclampsia how do we prevent if any of the risk factors are there we can start on aspirin 75 to 150 milligram and this should be started before 16 weeks of pregnancy so that this will prevent preeclampsia especially severe preeclampsia from happening let's do a few mcqs now on this topic so which of the following is not a predictor of preeclampsia increased pi in the uterine artery raised placental growth factor so increased pi is a predictor raised placental growth factor is not it's actually decreased placental growth factor so this is the answer decreased pape yes and past history of preeclampsia yes the most important pathophysiological change occurring in pregnancy is occurring in preeclampsia is increased levels of ADH in pregnancy incomplete trophoblastic invasion of the spiral arterioles in the myometrium increased renal plasma flow or decreased sft1 so the answer is incomplete trophoblastic invasion of the spiral arterioles in the myometrium Dokumenta.